Grange School, this is Characters, and we're back with another episode of Coaching Patchouli today. It's been a long summer and we're back to see how our progress has been, what she's learned, what she's unlearned, and to rectify any leaks she's developed over the summer. You want to say what's up? Hey guys, this is Patchouli, I'm back, and currently grinding 10 and L, which is quite exciting. Um, break even at the moment, which isn't the greatest. But I'm hoping that with this video, we'll identify some of my leaks and hopefully sort them out. Certainly will. Um, and have you noticed much of a difference between 5 no limit and 10 no limit? How does the change compare, just for anyone who's currently making this leap, how does the change between 5 and 10 compare to the previous one between 2 and 5? I've definitely noticed that there are a lot more thinkers at 10 and L. Um, I think people play generally at a higher level, however it's still really fishy and the regs are really bad. But people are three betting more, um, also as bluffs, and yeah I think I've had to up my game quite a bit, so it's actually improved my strategy a lot. Yeah, I hopefully. I mean the jump between 5 and 10 is definitely more substantial than the jump between 2 and 5, and yeah you will find like regs in abundance for the first time, but yeah as you say they're not going to be very good. Um, but at least they do try to think about things, they'll make a lot of mistakes because they think about things incorrectly, but at least they're actually thinking and not just clicking buttons. Yeah. Alright, so we've had, we're going to get into this in just a second, I've had one hell of an ordeal tonight trying to make this for you guys, we just, um, <laughs> Jeff's been on my back as usual, you know, Code Red, like saying you're getting fired tomorrow unless you turn this video out and all these horrible things, so, because he's constantly, like, whipping me, I've had to had to like make this even though we're not in the mood, but that's how much we love Grinder School. We're gonna churn this out for you guys anyway. Now I'm only kidding about Jeff, he's a nice guy. But the video is due, so we have to make it. And we just um we went through an ordeal there where we recorded a session and then the USB thing that we used to transfer it to my computer decided to mess up. Then we went to we went to my place, recorded a new session tried to record that and my computer messed up, then we realised that we had the old session at at Patchouli's place and we could just record it there using her computer, which we didn't even think about before. <laughs> so these are the, this is the intelligence of the people who make your instructive learning videos for you <laughs> here at Grinder School. Pretty top notch. Okay, let's get into this. So this one was definitely a lot better than the last boring one we just recorded, right? This is oh, a good yeah. video. Awesome. So the last one was spots. dire, yeah. I'm going to try not to talk over you much because I watched this video the, the other day on another site and the two instructors were just talking at the same time for like two minutes straight and I couldn't understand anything and I was like that's pretty terrible so we'll try and avoid that problem, that's something I learned. So King Jack here, um, pre-flop is a really easy ISO. You decide to make it 6x um, with one with two limpers, I think that's fine. Um, like 55, 60, something like that, pretty standard. Um, the fish under the gun is like 33-0 so far, he's slightly terrible, the other guy's probably overlimping like really wide as well, so we definitely want to ISO here. When we flop top pair it's usually good as well, versus two limping ranges, so that's one reason we want to isolate. Because on the flop we're just going to, if we flop like King XX or Jack XX with so top pair, we can just basically expect to have the best hand and get a lot of value from dominated Kings and Jacks. And here we see about like 70, that's kind of on the small side, but I don't mind this actually. Um, what were your thoughts for making a, such a small sea bet in this spot, slightly over half a pot? Well, because I basically got king high air, I was thinking make it a little bit smaller so that when I do get called and don't hit top pair or whatever, I'm not good, then I'm kind of losing. Losing less, less right. And um, it's the kind of spot as well where balance isn't important, you'll hear people bang on about balance, but it doesn't matter here against the total fish, he's still going to fold like, you know, it's jack nine suited, it's spades on this flop to this sizing. Um, yeah, I mean, I make like 75 or 80, I think it's fine. Uh, I just want to be a bit wary about inducing by making a really small sea bet, but this should be big enough that you don't really run into that territory. Um, also, it's kind of good because, like, well, he's not really folding, like, a 7 to any bet size. He's not folding, like, anything in between a 7 and a queen. He's certainly not folding a queen, so we do lose less. And if we get a turn that we want to barrel, like, say we get a 10 on the turn, which we're barreling 100% of the time with our equity and it being a bit of a scare card, it means that we've allowed weaker hands, I guess, to come along, like maybe calls us with like pocket fours sometimes when he wouldn't usually, or something like that. So it's got upsides as well. And 
then I guess also if we do barrel a turn, then it would be a smaller smaller turn, but due to smaller pot size as well. That's true, but then we stand to win less because it's less in the pot, so it's kind of equates to the same thing in that respect. Uh, we get raised and we fold. I think that's pretty standard for now with no information. There's not really a hell of a lot else we can do in that spot, in that situation. I need to have reads before I like three bit bluff there, otherwise it's really spewy against someone who limps under the gun and probably plays quite passively. And what are your thoughts very quickly on I'm gonna give you a question here. I know you said don't give me any tough questions because I'm tired, but you've learned nothing <laughs> about it since then. So what are your thoughts on what a fish's range is like when he raises you on that flop and what a reg's range is like? Well I think reg's ranges would be more draw heavy than right. a fish's range. Yeah, I agree with that. I think a fish could raise, well certainly top pair, um, they might even be raising say second or third pair just to like, find out where they're at. Yeah exactly, whatever. so the fish is going to be far less polarised than the reg basically. The reg's going to have draws, he's going to have maybe like ace queen, king queen at worst and then sets and then air, whereas the fish is going to have like middle pair or all queen x to find out where he's at blah blah blah. So yeah absolutely. So you're probably like less likely to get folds from a fish by 3-bet in there because top pair just doesn't ever fold and like, the fish has far more top pair than the reg so you got to resist the temptation to say he's repping nothing because he's probably repping something um, because he's repping all those top pair hands basically they're just like neither here nor there and aren't going away but aren't terribly strong at the same time. Uh, table 1, I think we're, are we 3-bet in here? Do we 3-bet? I really want to 3-bet in this spot. Um... This guy looks like he's opening wide in late position. Yeah. Um, I think it's an okay hand to three bet bluff with a suited. Character, yeah, I'd, but... I'd go that. I'd agree that it's okay. <clears throat> I wouldn't say it's a good hand. It's just the suit connector is so low here. Um, since we're not going to be three bet in like a zillion percent of the time versus this guy, I don't think there's any need to do it with this. I think basically our three bit bluff hands should consist of stronger hands than three four suited, like they should consist of like six seven suited, ace five suited, king eight suited, these hands play a lot better, um, just have more equity in general against this continuing range and flop a bit better as well, so I wouldn't be inclined to take a hand like ace seven offsuit or three four suited or king eight offsuit when I can look more for the top of my folding range than this, like I'd rather three bit king jack offsuit here than this, it just flops a lot better. Yeah, I did, I did choose to fold it in the end because I figured it, yeah. was, it was quite a low. So I mean like heads up for instance, this is a hand I always 3-bet straight away, like off the bat, because I'm flatting more hands. That's generally it. These hands that you are making part of your 3-bet bluff range, like ace 5 suited or king 8 suited or king 10 off suit, I am flatting those heads up because they play better because he's opening like any two cards. But here, because we're actually unable to flat those hands, we can sort of promote those to the 3-bit bluff range and therefore we can relegate a hand such as 3-4 suited that's actually worse than those into the folding range and then if it turns out this guy is like folding to 90% of 3-bets and he doesn't adjust then we could incorporate it in and have a wider 3-bit bluff range so that's kind of how it works. We open a 7 versus a fish, I would never fold a, an ace blind versus blind versus a weaker player who's just going to be folding on the flop and continuing with a very weak range calling down with third pair and things like it's a good hand to flop top pair with it's just I'm hoping yeah how long is this video maybe about 40 minutes all right so i don't think we'll get through all of it nah no way in hell usually get through about 20 to 25 unless we don't go into detail but i think it's better for everyone watching if we do go into and better for you if we do go into detail so i'll probably do like 20 25 minutes um, like seven eight offsuit there, like it's a again, it's kind of, kind of a weak hand. But I've got this other rule when it comes to three bet bluffing, and it's kind of a vague guideline more than a rule actually. But it's like, like when we have position on a wide opening range or just position in general, and we three bet, like our hand doesn't need to play as well because we just win more money, um, or lose more money, like depending on what happens. So we don't actually need a hand that flops as well because it's easier for us to win the pot, it's easier for us to check back and not get blown off our hand. So because of those things we don't need to flop as well, so often if I have like 7-8 suited, sorry 7-8 off suit, I might even just go ahead and 3-bet if I have position, just because position helps you so much, it doesn't matter so much and 
it helps us establish like a, an aggressive image from the start. So it's a possibility there. I mean, there are better hands to do it with. I don't hate folding, but just a thought that when you're in position, you don't need to worry as much about the caliber of your three-bit bluffing hands and more about situations and the spots because post-flop your legs a lot easier. So I don't put as much weight on hand selection when we're in position, basically. Okay. But I'd still avoid like total trash like queen three offsuit like we had there yeah. on table one. Okay, I always just wonder against, like, say, against cut-off opens, like, I guess because my HUD's not set up so well, so I can't really see exactly how wide they're opening mm -hmm. in the cut-off versus, versus the button. Yeah. Um, I kind of shy away from that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's easier for me because I look at what their cut-off open is directly, I suppose, and that helps. But even there, you don't have many hands, but I would guess that the guy's a reg just because his V-pit matches his PFR so far, and he's opened from late position, he's made it a reggy sizing, he has a full stack. He's likely not an all-over-the-place crazy fish, so, yeah. you know, it's a little bit of info. Like, people say you don't have an M for the guy, but you've always got some. Like, as long as you've got a few hands and you've seen him raise or you've seen him limp or something, you've got, like, you've got, like, guidelines to sort of infer things from about what's more likely. And I mean, in the long run, like if you say this guy's probably a reg 70% of the time and you make a play that's designed to work against a reg, then it'll work 70% of the time. And if you do it against a limping guy who's probably a fish, then it'll work like 30% of the time. So it does tell you things. Not 100% accurate, but it helps. Okay, so what are your thoughts on table two versus this? So this guy's a fish. Um, he min raises me. To be honest, I think it's a fold because it's a reverse implied odds hand. Yeah. I might end up in difficult spots and out of position. Totally. I'd rather just fold and wait for a better a better opportunity to totally to money. The old wait for a better spot scenario. Um yeah, I mean like this is like a jammer fold spot, like calling here is pretty horrible because we have to just give up when we miss the flop usually anyway. Um and when we do flop top pair or whatever it's often no good. Especially against a 30 0 who hasn't 3 bit yet. And his sizing is kind of like a power min raise. It looks like very nutted, very value, very like naturally orientated to be a value hand. So, yeah, we're full ace 10. I think with ace queen, like you can just go ahead and jam there probably. It's probably fine. Um, albeit not great. Ace king, you'd certainly jam. And like, yeah. sort of nines plus, I'd be jamming there too. Okay. Just to give you an idea of ranges. Because I mean, you do see guys that do that with like queen jack suited and ace jack sometimes and things like that. But. East 10 just about too weak against is the overall likelihood of what his range is, I think. So this is the third and possibly last episode of Coaching Patchouli for a while. We'll certainly do one as soon as she gets up to 25 no limit and see how she does there. But stay tuned for that and you'll be able to tell how she's doing because when that video comes out that'll be her at 25 no limit. Hopefully it won't be too long from Hopefully now. not. <laughs> but I think these have been quite a success so far. I think people like these so congrats to you Pichuli for entertaining the Grinder School guys. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, I'm a bit tired so if I come out with random utter shit, like even more utter shit than usual then just ignore it. It's fine. <clears throat> I've got like my whiteboard now in my room, which is where I write down like all my goals for the day. I've probably been over this. I don't know if I made a video while I had this, maybe I didn't. But it helps me, like I've got goals like make video, play a thousand hands of heads up, like <clears throat> study, watch a training video or whatever, so I get more done and I'd advise anyone else that struggles with effort, with volume, with enthusiasm, who's just generally has trouble motivating themselves to achieve their goals, you know, write them down and set yourself like a reward system. I've got like gold stars and and the post that we hear soon, right? <laughs> gold stars. So when I play the volume that I should play, I get a gold star. It's juvenile, but if it works and makes me money, then it's pretty awesome. Next time it's next time we have downtime it's your time to fill it up. You have to, oh, you have to go on a no. Today. You've got to go on a rant about something. <clears throat> That's how it works. Don't want to do one of these videos where they just don't speak during the downtime, right? Um, rant about how I spent three hours cleaning today, which is fun. Awesome. Sorting out my old flat. <sighs> yeah. I'm trying to think of a 
a poker-related pun to do with cleaning, but I'm failing miserably. It's not like me to fail at puns. So we have three hands here. It's bound to be something fun. Okay, table one, go. Again, reverse implied odds hand. Right. Out of position. Fold again. Same reasons. Yeah. yeah. Again, it's like jammer fold. It's definitely not a jam. He's you're eighteen twelve on that table as well. You've not done much. He's attacking your undergun open. It's ten and L. He probably has like ace queen plus jacks plus or something, and you're crushed by that. So. If you go back and watch my Trouble Hands series, you'll see a lot of instances where we just fold ace jack to three bets against unknowns because it just gets us into trouble. Hence the name of the series. And there's also some cool drawings on that series with monsters. So yeah, go and watch it if you haven't. I definitely recommend it. So here we see bet. Uh, 70 seems fine, if that's what we're going to bet. Looks good to me. Fives, I like the call. I mean, kind of early days. We don't have huge amounts of implied odds here, but we do have a fish in the big blind to get through a pot, and we have position to mess about with this guy post flop too, so. I like to be tight with pocket pairs out of position, but there I think it's totally fine. Right, so we bet the flop and get two callers on 10 6 6. Um, this is a weird spot, like it's a really bad turn card, obviously. Yeah. Um, I don't even know what I want to do here. Um, the fish is going to continue with. Any 10, any 6, and probably any other pair. Pocket pair, however, don't make up that much of his range. The reg is basically going to have like a 10 or a 6. Fairly frequently, he won't have. Well, I don't even know if it's a reg, actually, Silver Star, he might not be. But he's going to have like pocket pairs sometimes as well, but I think one of these guys has a 10 or a 6 pretty often. I think I like just, um, I don't like betting the turn, because I just feel like one of them has a 10 or 6 so often, and you're just getting called every time someone does. They can have draws, which they now fold. No one's, you don't get any value from draws by betting this turn. Um, check folding also seems kind of weird though. Mm -hmm. But then, are they going to bet hand like pocket 8s here, pocket 9s? Probably not. And I don't really like check folding against the fish just because he could have like ace high or something as well. I guess I would just shrug and bet two dollars and fold if the reg does anything. If the reg calls, I'll check fold the river mm -hmm. and expect to be like probably okay against the fish, although not super great against them. But you'll have some other pairs there as well. But I don't think check folding would be too bad. Because <clears throat> okay. it's just such a bad turn card three way, it's likely that someone has a beat here pretty often. So. Yeah. And also, like, checking's good here because if the fish bets and the reg calls, you've also got an easy fold in that situation. Mm -hmm. Because then you've gained info that the reg probably has a 10 or a 6, right? Like, if, if the fish bets and the reg calls. So, by the time it gets around to you, you've got an easy decision. If the fish jams and the reg folds, I would just call. Because you could have, like, heart 7, 8, 7, 9, he's jamming, like, ace high sometimes, any pocket pair. I've now changed my mind and I've decided that we should check fold versus the reg and we should check call versus the fish as long as the reg folds. Okay. And then we should bet the river for the fish's stack if it checks through, probably, or something like that. Yeah, because usually with spots like these where I don't really know what to do, I end up bet folding, <laughs> yeah. if I'm in doubt. Yeah, it's certainly a good, a good idea, but there it's just nice because we get we can check, right? We're only going to bet one more street against the reg for value anyway, and we can do that on the river. And by checking, we get to sometimes put in no more money in spots where we're crushed because we find out that we're crushed mm -hmm. without putting in any more money. So I kind of like it, and the fish will jam his ace high there a lot of the time, or he'll jam whatever he has with that sort of static pot ratio left, so... Yeah, I mean, you either bet fold um, to put the fish in, or you can just check and get the rest in versus the fish one way or the other, mm -hmm. and then just value bet river if it checks through. It's a weird spot, like your hand just isn't as strong as it looks there, because that turn sucks. But it's certainly like got too much merit to just like check hold versus the fish. Just because he can have so much ace high or whatever. Um, yeah, pretty standard three bet. 
small blind versus button with Ace King. I hope there aren't any more like weird spots like that at this time of night. It's really it's draining. Table four. So because I just got battering <laughs> for an ace queen hand. You didn't get a battering, you just got told that you shouldn't have played it the way you played it. <laughs> they were harsh, man. No. Um so I've been I've been very timid with calling <laughs> with ace queen when out of position. Uh -huh. Um or against like under the gun opens. Right. So in this spot it was kinda like, oh I don't know. Can I call? Is it a three bet or fold? Yeah, I mean three bet in here has got like a few problems, just that we don't know how this guy reacts to three bets, so it's often the case, like especially when we were running eleven zero on the table, that he's just gonna fold all worse hands to a three bet. Yeah. Right? So by three betting we're often just inflating the pot against the stronger hands and then taking down the money against his weaker hands. Which isn't a terrible thing because he folds more often than not. However, we can just do that with like 9 7 suited. Mm -hmm. And we can just call with ace queen and we let, let the fish and the big blind come along as well. And we dominate a lot of his hands and we're doing okay. Rest of the regs opening range, he's 22 19 from the hijack. Ace queen's gonna play fine there. We're gonna, when we flop top pair, we're usually good. We're not like, it's not like he's a 10 8 opening under the gun and we have to fold it here. So I definitely just call in the spot. Okay. Until I know more. If I thought I could 3-bet for value, I would go ahead and 3-bet. Um, or if I thought that I couldn't flat, but I had a lot of fold equity by 3-betting, then I could make him fold, like, the bottom of his opening range, like ace-10, ace-jacks, like, pocket pairs, lots of pocket pairs, and I might 3-bet as a sort of semi-bluff as well. But given I know nothing about his 3-bet reacting tendencies, I wouldn't 3-bet. Okay. Um, but I would certainly not fold, so I think it's just a flat. Um, well, I think I folded. Oh, well. We live and learn. <laughs> That's what these videos are for. But the other spot you posted was against an under the gun open from a tighter player than this, and that's yeah. why people will want you to fold. But it was mainly post flop that you got the, the battering, as you call it, mm -hmm. for it anyway. That wasn't the best play time. Yeah, well, you got to be thick skinned in this industry. Like, people always. I know you're not like this and you can handle it, but a lot of people have, like, ego problems and they, they tend to kick off and stop listening and sort of argue their point to death even though it's wrong and refuse to accept defeat when people give them a hard time about hand but it's the best thing to do is just realize that the person posting if he's a stronger player than you probably knows what he's talking about and you can learn a lot from him and you just have to ignore the tone of the post type thing so you get that everywhere people are arrogant in poker because they're very sort of proud of what they've achieved so far and they want to show it to the world and yeah but you just got to take that with a pinch of salt Okay, um, what happened on, is that blind versus blind? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, pretty standard, just to see about there. Do we open threes there on table three, yeah? Yeah. Ace nine six, uh, that guy's so tight that, that guy on the button, like, mm -hmm. but I'd still always see it, like, I think the guy on the, big blind is just folding a hell of a lot. The guy in the button won't even peel you with like 10s there because A is tight and B has got a guy behind him to worry about and there's an okay. ace on the board. So, mm -hmm. And how many aces does an 11-0 actually flat on the button as well? That's another thing. Does he flat like ace-10? Probably not. Probably has like ace-queen and ace-king. That's not very many combos and then he has a lot of like 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, 8s, 7s, uh, like king-queen suited maybe, hands like that perhaps. So I wouldn't worry too much about him. I think your C bet easily gets through like, you know, a good amount versus him, like two thirds of the time plus. And against PAL 208, it probably gets through a good amount as well. Like checking here is not horrible. I mean, you have an under pair, you have like the worst equity you can ever have against better hands in this spot. Like you only have two outs, I don't hate it. But given that guy's so tight and he just doesn't have many aces and he's just probably folding a bunch of pocket pairs here. And the other guy's gonna have a really wide range for peeling there, multi-way, I think just c is probably good. And I would make it like 60. I think that does the job of folding out the pocket pairs from the button and folding out the air from the other guy and a lot of the guy's range is air, so mm -hmm. I think it's fine, but I don't mind your line. I think it's okay as well. Okay. I think I've been a little bit worried about being too aggro and betting in spots where I probably shouldn't be. Yeah. So I guess because I had of the weak showdown value mm -hmm. and it was multi-way then then I thought maybe checking was 
Yeah, it's not bad, certainly, but the board is dry, it's good for your range, and you are going to get some folds as well, so I don't hate it. Here I would, with King 8, you're getting such a great price there, and you're like a bit deep. What happened was we opened King 8, and we got min 3 bet plus 10 cents, and we were in position. And it was this this guy here, this hang UK guy, who 3 bet is. I would call. I mean, it's only another 40 cents. We're pretty much like... How deep, deep are we there? We're like, what, 100, 130, 120 big blinds or something? And if we get the right flop, I think his range is probably really tight. He seems very passive so far. And also, like, even if his range isn't tight, like, he's probably going to play really badly and we have position, he might just be giving up pots and he's passive and stuff post flop. Like, it's probably definitely plus, it definitely is plus EV, just like peel there with a King 8 suited. Like, King 8 off suit, I can see folding, but King 8 suited for that price. Mm -hmm. I just call if he 3x's it and I see folding, but being a bit deep and him being a bad player and having position, I just don't think we can fold. I'd always open 5-4 there as well, like you've got two tight blinds and the guy on the button's horrible. Yeah, he has position on you, but he's horrible and he's still going to be plus EV, so in the cutoff there with that 4-5 suit yeah, that okay. open, so just a small thing. On table 4, we open the cutoff and then bet the flop, yeah? Okay, so why don't you have a little, I've been sort of like ranting for hours now, so. About the turn here. Yeah, what do you think about the turn and the SBR and how that affects bet sizing and blah blah blah. Yeah, SBR. Right, um, so we've got a guy on our left who's really short, he's probably likely to jam over any bets here. Mm -hmm. But, um, and so we've got a straight, but I don't like the fact that the board is paired. Um, I should maybe not worry too, too much about that as it's only like Jackson. It's players. going in here like you... Basically, you have to get in here, but you okay. just have to find the best way to get in, basically, because uh -huh. you can never fold because you haven't crushed. Alright. It's much easier to have a jack here, or have a king, or have a draw here than it is to have a queen, just combinatrix wise, and mm -hmm. you're fine, so don't worry about that. Okay. I'm pretty sure I bet this turn. Yeah, so what would, how much would you bet? Well, let's, um, let's see what you bet first. 90. I think it's good. I mean, we just need to bet an amount that allows us to get it in by the river. He will have a draw here, like sometimes, like a plus draw. We want them to put more money in as well. Um, a king or a jack, like never falling anyway, I wouldn't think. So if we bet 90, that's going to make the pot like 3 on the river with like 2.45 behind. I'd maybe make it like a dollar, and that way it just gives him a better price, maybe a dollar, dollar ten, because I don't think he ever folds in that turn. And we get more money from his flush draws. And if he has like a jack 10 or jack 9 or something, just make sure that he doesn't find a fold in the river. So just mm -hmm. a nitpicking thing there, but it'd make it a tiny bit bigger for that reason. And he folds, so I have no idea. Oh, we were three way there? What the hell? Yeah, okay, just bet bigger then. Just keep building the pot versus the other guy. Like, almost pot it, in fact. So you can bet the river bigger. Okay. Because he's probably not folding. Uh, we get like the worst river in the world here. Yeah. Um, here we just have to check fold, really. I don't check see. fold, okay. Did he check to us, yeah? Yeah, he checked to us. Well, we're just checking back. Okay. Like, we can't get a jack to fold, we can't get a king to fold, we beat busted draws that don't have a pair. Yeah. We can't get quads to fold, we have absolutely no reason to bet this river whatsoever, we're just losing money to better hands, and he's folding any sort of busted quad draw anyway. Okay. So... I think I went for my usual strategy of, ah, oh, I don't know what to do, bet fold. Our hand just isn't strong enough to bet fold because it's the case yeah. that any pair has his beat. Yeah. Any pair he had yeah. on the turn has his beat. Right? And what does he call us with that isn't a pair? Mm hmm. 10 9? Probably even folds that, like, on this board. Like, Why's a fish? <laughs> yeah, but there's three queens on there. Well, who cares? Yeah, 10 9's a tiny part of his range yeah. anyway, but the point is. Unless you can somehow give me a reason that we should bet here, I'm going to advocate that we never ever bet here. Because we don't know what's better to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, that makes sense. Yeah, so this is a, a horrible bet if yeah. we make it. Uh, I like your sizing because basically it, it's a bet that's going to lose you whatever amount you bet over the long run when he has you beat. So if you bet 120, you're either taking down the pot or losing 120. And if you bet 250, you're either taking down the pot or losing 250. Mm -hmm. So, the best bet size here is five cents, but that's like the that's like the twelfth best bet size that you could. <laughs> no, the twenty fourth best bet size you could make, right? Oh no, this is ten and L. Yeah, it's the twelfth. Yeah. 
So oh, there's yeah. 11 better bet sizes than that. Starting at betting 10 cents, then 20 cents is slightly worse, oh, yeah. then 30 mm -hmm. cents is slightly worse. I'm just being a dick. <laughs> And he raises, so now we just have to fold, yeah. obviously. I think at that point I realised how bad that bet was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like these boards are just like, like even if it's a jack on the river, like it's nowhere near as bad because you can still call with like a king maybe or like an ace for his ace kicker with two pair. But on that, there's just nothing you can call with it's worse. Um, King 10, like I like a 3-bet here. Do we have fold to 3-bet number on that fellow? We've got like 3 or 2 hands on him. Yeah, uh, I think fold to 3-bet is the second one from the left on the bottom there. 90. So 90. Snap 3-bet here. We yeah. can't flat it. It's like near the top of our folding range. It has blockers. We want to be 3-bet in a very wide bluff range against this guy because he All folds right. so much. So King 10, so it's definitely incorporated into that. Uh -huh. Like a 3-bet to 3-4 here as well. So dude, a Remember that we didn't 3-bet at the start of the video, we mm -hmm. 3-bet a whole host of hands here. So King 10, being near the top of my folding range and having blockers and us having possession, just an easy 3-bet there. Hmm. What would my 3-bet for value range look like? I guess that depends on his cutoff open. It does a little bit, right? But if he's folding to 90% of 3-bets, yeah. then you can't 3-bet for value wide because he's just folding too often, right? Okay. So, I mean, I might, I'd probably just have the strategy where I just flat like aces versus him. Right. For now. If he's folding 90%, I don't want to make him fold out all these hands that can flop top pair that we can stack post-flop. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather just let him get into trouble post-flop when we have position by flatting aces and then 3-bet bluffing him to the extreme that he just has to stop folding to 90% and then we can 3-bet the value of aces okay, and queens, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's not a hand that I would... Maybe ace king, just because it's such a fun hand to three bet and jam, and it's not as nice to flat as like aces or kings. But like, I'd still probably flat it and just like outplay him in position. And yeah, I probably don't have a value three bet range in that spot until he starts actually calling or reacting to three bets in a okay. different way. Sounds weird, but you don't have to always three bet when you have a typically three bettable value hand. You know, mm -hmm. you can if your opponent's always folding, then there's better ways to get value. But you will need to exploit him just by bluffing the hell out of him and then you'll find he will adjust eventually be it over the next 10 hands or the next 500 does this program show how long we've been recording? I don't think so how long have we been recording? <laughs> I'm not entirely sure I've been wondering that myself <laughs> maybe about these spots just hour? keep coming up with this Jackie yeah so this guy's done this like twice now uh, how often is he? Do we have a three bit stat there? Thirteen percent. Thirteen percent. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't mind just folding here because our hand gets us into a lot of trouble. We're in position like, this time now. We are in position. That definitely helps. And we've seen that he is definitely probably capable of three bit and light. Mm -hmm. Although we're not too sure. I don't mind calling here, but I definitely don't mind folding as well. Okay. I feel like he's checks to do his queen and definitely like calling a lot better. Yeah. But it's just a hand that doesn't play that well at any any time unless we know he's 3 bet and light I and mean, we don't think we know that over only 25 hands I'd probably still fold here it seems nitty but for a lot of people who don't have great post flop abilities at, the, at these stakes um, you're probably better just like avoiding a lot of post flop mistakes and just folding a hand as sort of potentially disastrous as ace jack off suit yeah. just because like if he happens to have just 3 bet twice because he had a good hand we can just be getting in lots of money pre flop totally dominated and in bad shape so if I knew it was 3-bit and light, I'd always call here. I don't know that yet. I'd probably fold, but I don't mind calling because he probably is 3-bit and somewhat light, but we don't know. I mean, he's only done it, like, what, once so far? So yeah. This is the second time, so we don't really have an extensive sample here. So I like a fold. It's a hard hand to it. play. Yeah, I like the fold. I mean, <laughs> it's a hard hand to play post-flop as well when you see bets and we brick, like, we're going to, like, two-thirds of the time. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how I feel about playing back at him when we don't have any reads of his 3-bit range and it's a game that runs passively and stuff, so nah, I like the folder.
like your full to three bet stat should be pretty damn high in these games. Like it should go down as you move up in stakes and people start three betting you more. But you know, it could be like seventy five, eighty percent, there wouldn't be a hell of a lot wrong with that in these games. Yeah. Yeah, my full to three bet's certainly high. But it also it depends on who I've got on the blinds. If I've got really three betty regs, yeah. then I tend to either four bet bluff or Yeah. Flat and four bit bluffing against three bet rigs, I'd imagine, works really well at ten and L, where oh, yeah. people just don't know about four betting yet. Mm-hmm. Like at fifteen L, people like to jam over your four bets and stuff, but ten and L, like they're not even at that stage yet. Jack eight's like a snap fold. This guy's stats are very passive, and he's just not done a whole lot, and he's not been three betting. So generally, you can infer like from a V pip that's like thirty nineteen. Like that gap there just usually tells you that your opponent's more passive and if you don't have like reads on the three bit tendencies, it can sort of hint you in the direction that they're probably tight just from the V bit and PFR, so that's fine. Alright, do you want to talk about a hand here? Yeah, so I wanted to ask about um the turn on table two. Uh huh. So because the flop checked through, yeah. it was um a limped pot. And I was thinking, does it have the turn? Is that right? If you bet the turn, I'd always bet the river. Okay. If it's a brick, just because there's so many like spades, gut shots, crap like that you can have here. Yeah. I think if he has like an ace or jack, like, I mean he does have, he probably doesn't have an ace a lot here at all. Uh huh. Because he'll bet the flop, even though he's passive, he'll still bet the flop. He has like some slow play bullshit, like ace eight, but not much of that either. He also has queen x in this turn, which he won't fold on turn or river, and it's quite a lot of combos, but I like betting here, but, you know, king high calls is, and probably 10 high calls is, and we lose to all those hands. Yeah. So if we bet turn, we need to bet river as well, because that's a lot of combinations, basically. There's more combinations of king x and 10x than there are of queen x, with there being a queen out there blocking some of them, right? Mm-hmm. So his range is more weighted towards like gut shots and draws. So if we bet this turn, which I think is kind of marginal, but probably okay, then we need to bet like the three of clubs river every time. No, we have showdown value on that. We need to bet the four of clubs river every time, mm-hmm. right? Okay. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Like yeah. the whole... He has so many 10x and king x here when he calls. Um, if he, and he might call one with like 8, 9, or just a random 8 and then fold it on the river as well, so that's another reason to bet twice, so he can have an 8. Mm-hmm. Also, he could even fold the jack on the river, so basically like his range, you just don't fold out anything by betting this turn, not really. You fold out like 9 deuce, you fold out maybe sometimes 10x or king x, but usually he probably peels with them, because he's a fish. So it's mandatory to know why you're betting the turn to be betting the river if you do bet this turn. Okay. But I think checking the turn is also like okay. But bet turn bit river might be slightly best overall. This river like sucks, you just have to check fold it. Um yeah. like if he has ten X now, he's probably not gonna fold it just because he has ten. Um and lots of King X just made it straight and a lot of hands made two pair, like ten A Jack eight. Um any nine also made a straight, like any like Jack nine, eight nine, hand like that, it's made straight, you just like have to check fold here. Yeah. And when you check, you should expect to lose most of the time. <clears throat> Queen four, I don't expect him to fold over two streets, but there's enough hands that he will that you can just bet twice. Flop top set here, just going to start betting for value. And um, we do like completely cripple this board, but this 56 26 guy probably plays a lot of 6x and stuff, so the stuff he can call you with. And building a pot when you're 100 deep is more important than giving a free card to try and induce action. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't slow play there, although there are arguments for it, I don't think it's best. Okay, how does my sizing look? Um, it looks okay. Um, I was thinking it's a bit of a drier board. Yeah. And because I'll be bluffing a lot on these types of boards, then I guess I don't have to, to kind of balance my range. Yeah, you don't have to worry about that too much, no. I think your sizing is fine. Like. You could make it a bit smaller just to because you block so much top pair. Mm-hmm. So when you block like all the top pair, you want the main hands you want to get called by are like second pair. Do six, six x, mm-hmm. um, pocket fives. So maybe if you think that betting ninety will accomplish that, you could bet like ninety or eighty or something, and then go from there. I don't mind betting a bit smaller. I think optimal. I think your bet size is a tiny bit big, but it's not a big deal. Okay. It's just an unfortunate flop for you because you're going to get pulled so often. Like, I'd much rather the flop was 5, queen, 7 than 
king something something. Mm -hmm. There's just so many more combinations of top pair in the range. Like I'm always like, if I three bet aces for value and the flop comes ace x x, I'm always like sort of sighing because I just know that blocks so much of the deck. Like it sucks. <clears throat> Jack three. Mm. I thought it was a bit of a loose open. Yeah, it's okay to fold there. That guy just looks so bad though, I don't mind it. To just try and get into loads of pots with him. Mm -hmm. But Jack three is maybe a bit on the loose side. Tens is like pretty standard call there, we don't know enough to three bit. And on this flop, we're probably just going to peel a C bet and go from there. Because we have plenty of equity against this C bet in range here. Yeah, yeah it always just call here. I think your games came on a hell of a lot from the last time. On this turn, I probably just, um, let me pause real quick. Um, our flush here isn't great. I don't think he has many worse flushes in his range. If he does have worse flushes, they're only calling one. Yeah. I'd rather check back here and then be able to play a river and value bet if checked on the river than bet the turn. I think this is a pretty clear check. Because if he doesn't have a diamond, he's usually just check folding this turn all the time. Okay. Um, if he does have a diamond, it's either a better diamond, so we lose less by betting mm -hmm. less streets, or sometimes he has a worse diamond that will only call one street probably anyway, so we should just bet the river. The advantages to betting the river and not the turn are that, firstly, um, it just, I don't know, I think that sometimes it makes our range look weaker. Like, to these guys who don't really know how to hand read, I think that when they see you check a turn and you bet a river, I think they're more likely to curiosity call you with a jack because they only have to call one, so they don't have to worry about the hammer of future bets, as Sklansky called it in one of his books, Theory of Poker and Knowledge of Poker or something. He called it the hammer of future bets, and that basically means that a lot of first level thinkers are more likely to call you light on the river with marginal showdown value than they are on the turn. And that's because they don't have to worry about having to call more than one bet. They know that that's all they have to call is that one bet. It's the end of the hand. So I think you've got more chance of getting called by non-diamonds on the river than you do on the turn if you bet. And also it gives him a chance to reignite some ace kind of clubs bluff on the river. Like maybe he's checking there to see what you do and then when you check back he assumes you don't have a diamond then he'll stab at it to make you fold a pair on the river and then you can call. Mm -hmm. So betting, because you can only bet one street here and betting the river is better for all those reasons, it's the river that you should bet and therefore it turns a check. Okay. Right, does that make sense? So that's yeah. kind of the reasoning behind that. Well I think again I went for my bet fold option. <laughs> <laughs> Because I guess in spots like this I kind of assume, oh well he checks, he must not have a diamond. If he does have a diamond he'll let me know and I'll fold because it will probably be better than mine. Yeah, but then you're kind of just betting to get called by the better hands. Oh I did worse. check. Yeah, I think it's a good check. Because now like he can, I think he will also check like the jack of diamonds. When he pots this, like this is so weird. It's so weird like. Does he really check the ace of diamonds on the turn? Like, does he? That's so bad if he does. Like, maybe he does. Maybe he goes for a check raise. Like, does he pot it with the queen or king of diamonds? Possibly, because you've checked back the turn. I was saying that we should call the bet, but when he, like, snap pots it like that straight away, mm -hmm. I just feel like, what, often not good. Like, I said that he might reignite a bluff in the river, but that wasn't, like, something I thought he would do that often. It was just something he might do, so it gives us more options. But, mm. And this guy also doesn't seem very aggro. No. His aggression factor is zero. That's a top right. And often as well, right? Like, think about his range here. When he opens, like in... He opens a cutoff there. Or did he open hijack? Was there a guy in the other seat? I, I don't think know. it was a hijack. I think it was too. Um, so if he opens hijack there, like, he's going to have... Ace king, ace queen, and then he's going to have pocket pairs, right? Pocket pairs are still going to have showdown value. A lot of time they're going to check. Like, people just don't turn nines into bluff here. People don't bet here with a set. People don't bet here with a jack, ever. So he never has a jack, right? Mm -hmm. So we can already take out all the combos of, like, king, jack, ace, jack. Then we can take out, like, all the pocket pairs, because usually, like, 
they either have a diamond for marginal showdown value or they're just not bit in any way, so he hardly ever has a pocket pair here either. So what does he have here? He has either ace king, ace queen, or ace ten, or like king queen, with or without a diamond. That is the majority of his range, like regardless of whether he has a flush or not, that is what makes up most of his range. We'll start from that point, right? Mm -hmm. And then we need to take the next step of breaking down whether he has a diamond or not. So how often does he have a diamond when he has those hands? Half the time, right? Half the time ace-king will contain a diamond, half the time ace-queen will contain a diamond, right? Possibly more often, yeah. So we'll have a diamond like quite a lot here. And does he blo does he make this bet 100% of the time when he has like ace or king of diamonds? Probably. Does he make this bet as a bluff 100% of the time? Nowhere near. So because he has a diamond like at least as much as he doesn't have a diamond here, and he bluffs far less than he value bets with the diamond, I think we should fold. Because the rest of his range just doesn't really bet this river. Okay. And the hands that do bet this river have a diamond more often than they don't, just due to his likely frequencies and combinations and things like that. So. But then the other argument is that wouldn't he bet the turn if he had an ace or king of diamonds, so that discounts them. But overall, in the big picture, like pot-sized insta-bet from a guy who hasn't done too much when he has a lot of flushes in his range and isn't bluffing too much here. Meh. I think folding's good. Yeah, I guess at these stakes I just kind of assume people are really bad and when he sizes it like this, mm -hmm. that really makes me think bluff. Because I think if he was going to be value betting like an ace or a king of diamonds, I think he'd make it smaller trying to induce calls rather than mm. scaring off these hands. Possibly, but if he's slow played an ace or king of diamonds on the turn, he's going to be wanting to make up for his missed value most True. of the time. That's the way these guys think. I don't think he ever has the queen of diamonds with this size. So I'd take out a lot of those combos. Mm -hmm. King of diamonds, he may or may not make it this size. I think the ace of diamonds like very frequently sizes like this. Because he's already missed a streak and he's trying to make up for that. I think it's a close spot. I don't know. It depends on his bluffing frequencies. If he's like spaz. And I also think that if he's going to bluff this hand, he's just going to bluff the turn quite often as well. Like, I think that it's a scare card. If he has like ace king of clubs, he's just going to bet the turn like quite often and expect okay. you to fold like a jack or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, I've seen this line a lot and like, in my experience, I just don't think we have 33% equity here. But I don't think it can be too horrible to call. I don't know. I'm guessing you called him one by your reaction, but we'll see. <laughs> <clears throat> Oh my god, what the hell is that? I guess you've got to also factor in total spaz with air as well. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, but it's very strange. Well, I maybe thought by me checking back the turn that I didn't have a diamond. But there's no reason. Because kings would hold. But then why does he bet? Why doesn't he just show his hand down? Like, he's not getting any better hands to fold, really. He maybe thinks he's value betting. That's strange. I don't know how these guys think, but he obviously can't get called by, by worse. And also, if he wants to pot it, like, he's, like, never getting called by worse. Like, if he's value betting, you'd expect him to bet, like, two-thirds pot or something instead. Pot size bet with a hand that's barely, like, constituting thin value there is pretty horrible. So he's just only getting called by better hands. So I take a note on that for sure, that he just doesn't understand, like, relative hand strength. Mm -hmm. And he's making, like, what I'd call a value bluff. I think we've been recording for a good while now. We can probably wrap this up. Um, we'll have a look at this hand here. What happened on table four? Not sure exactly. I think... I think I must have iced the fish. And I see that the turn... Or, sorry, the flop. And my bottom pair. Check back the, the turn, I think. Yeah, it seems fine. I mean, I'd see that there just because the fish has a really wide range. You'll be folding a lot. And your hand isn't strong enough to try and show down there, really. Mm -hmm. On that board, and then I check back the turn because he's just not folding a jack or a ten. Yeah. And then on the river, like I just value bet like sort of one sixty or something, trying to get called by a jack or a ten. You nearly went back to one sixty, <laughs> <laughs> like one seventy or whatever. It's all good. <clears throat> Ace nine was this anything? It's a while since I recorded yeah. this there. 
Yeah, it's a fish that's open really wide there. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of like don't mind three betting for value. Because okay. you gain initiative here. He's opening like 26%. He seems pretty bad. I think he'll peel your C bets and then check hold a lot on the flop. And also when you flop like top pair, you're probably doing okay. Versus a wide range. So it's kind of just for value. Kind of just to get the initiative back in the hand. And mm -hmm. just sort of... Ace nine is kind of borderline. Definitely with ace ten, I would three bet for value there. Yeah. I think against that guy. Okay. Ace jack for sure, and calling's not too bad as well. I have a like three bet there. <clears throat> this board, I'd probably just check fold. We have like no equity, and he looks stationary and things. I don't really want to try and make him fold a king or queen or anything like that or anything with equity. Uh, on table three, there's another ace okay. queen versus. This is the last hand for sure. Under the gun open, where I was yeah. like. Mm. Um, 21 17. <laughs> Opens under the gun, we have position. Um, do we have any fish in the blinds? Not possibly one in the big blind. I'd probably call there, but it's not like super great. But having position in the game is a bit, a bit less tight than the guy in the hand that you posted mm -hmm. before. So, but hold on. So, <clears throat> if we did have fish in the blinds, mm -hmm. would that make it more of a fold or more of a call? Because ace queen doesn't play well multi way, it doesn't play well like multi way like if you're talking black and white against other hands but against fish it dominates shitloads of their range and you have position on fish so it yeah. plays awesomely okay it plays badly multi way if you're like out position against ranges that aren't wide and the players aren't bad like if you're playing against like a t like tight or medium ranges with relatively decent solid players who don't make loads of mistakes post flop mm -hmm. In that case, like your ace queen's not doing great multi way, but against fish who call with very dominated hands and then make like loads of mistakes with top pair, it plays awesomely. Yeah, but then so, how about the fact that we've got the reg under the gun <clears throat> as well in the hand? Well, we still expect to be doing like okay against his range. You assume he's open like king queen ace jack pocket pairs and things that we have equity against. It's not like we're totally crushed, um, and making up. And it more than makes up for it. We've got fish who are going to call with dominating hands if we didn't have those fish. It right. more than make up for it. So, but we obviously like if the reg bets like two, three streets multi way into like several people. Like we obviously aren't going to pay off three streets with ace queen the yeah. top pair. So as long as we know that we're going to play it very differently against the reg that we are against the fish, then it's going to be fine. Okay, guys, we're going to round up there. Um, leave any questions or comments on the thread for this video, and feel free to ask Patchouli comment questions as well. Nothing too, nothing too daunting, obviously. But you can ask her a few questions about why she did whatever if she didn't explain it, and I can ask her and get back to you. Or you can ask me questions about any of my thought process, or if you agree or disagree, or what you think. So, um, this has been Patchouli and Characters for Grinder School, and I'll see you next month with a new video series of some description. And good luck till then. Thanks.